Uh, hi, everybody. Well, it's all black on that, so I can't see anything. Um, so this is something that has intrigued me for a while, and I'll tell it like a story. Once upon a time, because I'm going to, the story I'm going to tell you is actually almost universal, and it's been thought about for centuries in Asia, and it's also been thought about centuries ago by this guy, Blaise Pascal, uh, when he was a, a relatively young man, right? He had this quote that has stuck with me for many, many years. And he says that all of humanity's problems stem from the inability of a person to sit quietly in a room alone, right? Alone, quietly, for a while. I don't know how many of you have tried this thing, okay? Um, this room is you're not alone here, but your thoughts are probably already wondering, right, you know, what's this guy going on about? Some of you might have tried this, okay? You might have, you're still sitting alone in a room, there might have been a couple of you go up to a mountain top, try to meditate, uh, get your mind under control. But I guarantee you, if you have tried this, you will find very, very quickly, usually after about 10 seconds, your mind will start to wander, right? It is inevitable. No matter what you do, what you focus on, whether you're focusing on your breath, whether you're focusing on somebody that you know, somebody that you love, whatever, inevitably, your mind will wander, right? I challenge you, during the wonderful performance just now that we heard on that instrument, it would have been inevitable that your mind wandered, right? There is persistent activity in your mind, no matter what you do, unless you are dead, okay? Uh, your brain is always active. Um, so I would say that um, uh, that last part of that statement um, is quite true. People are unable normally to sit quietly in a room, but really... What happens, right? You would normally do this. You would normally take out the nearest object to distract you. You would pick up your phone. You would uh, do something, go on the computer or whatever. Uh, I'm very curious as to why you have to all right, why is this? And this is a fantastic experiment that was published uh, just three years ago, right? So it starts from an observation uh, from America. This is an American group, and they said that 95% of the adult Americans that they had interviewed uh, reported that they did some leisure activity in the past 24 hours, and they, you know, they enjoyed their leisure activity. But 83% of the people said that they did not spend any time relaxing or thinking, okay? So they're asking, how come people don't spend their time relaxing or just thinking? And so they were asking, is there something that is more pleasant to do? Or is there something inherently unpleasant about relaxing and just thinking? All right, so they, they took people into a room, this is a lab, they took people to a playing room and they asked them to spend up to 15 minutes there and come out and rate their experience. And, and you know, most people say, well, it was not very enjoyable, I got bored, I really didn't know what to do. So then they said, okay, well now see, is it really unpleasant or is it just that you um, want something to do? And so they gave them a little device that they can shock themselves with. Okay, so uh, then, uh, and then they ask the people, oh, how unpleasant is that? Would you pay money not to be shocked? And they say, yes, yes, I will pay money not to be shocked. Now, then they say, okay, go, uh, took another group of people, go into this room, uh, go into this room, spend 15 minutes there, do nothing, but if you want, you can shock yourself, okay? And you know what? Most people, especially the men, shock themselves, right? 12 out of 18 men would just go there, spend a bit of time in <laughs> right? They had to shock themselves. Most people would give themselves under four shocks within that time. But there was one guy who gave himself 190 shocks within that period, right? He was just so bored, he really wanted to be shocked. Yeah, the women was like 25%, only women are a bit uh, more at ease with doing nothing. But anyway, the point, the point is that rather than do nothing, they would give themselves pain. So doing nothing is so aversive to many people that doing something bad is even better. 
Okay, so why is that? Why do we have this really bizarre property of the mind that you must do something? Yeah, so back to this question, why is the brain consistently active? So I'm a scientist, okay, and, and uh, I study the brain. And uh, we know that uh, having the brain do all this activity is extremely expensive. Most of the food that you eat goes to keep your brain doing this kind of activity, you know, buzz, 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 all the time. Uh, it's very, very expensive. And also, it is dangerous. Okay, if you keep your brain active all the time, there is a chance it would just lapse into a epileptic state, right? Free form firing, and then you can get all kinds of things from total, um, total convulsions to partial loss of attention and so on. So your brain is tolerating this kind of danger for some reason, right? It must be there for something. You know, I, I almost lost it a year ago because I had total loss of consciousness from loss of too much activity in my brain. So I know personally it can happen. And, um, and I want to know why. So I was reading around and I read the, some very interesting things into, uh, from the scientist or physicist called Per Bach, who wrote this book called uh, How Nature Works, okay? And his, his paper is one of the highest cited papers in physics ever. And to understand Per Bach, all you got to do is this. You go to the beach, okay? You go to the beach and you look at the sand and you take a grain of sand and you drop a grain of sand on the beach. And what happens? Nothing right? There's a grain of sand dropping on the beach. But if you do this, if you're a crab now, and you dig, 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 and you make a pile of sand, right? Eventually, there will come a point where one grain of sand will cause the entire pile to collapse, okay? So you keep on and on and on and on, adding little bit, grain by grain by grain, and suddenly there's a big event. Okay, a small event triggers a big event if it keeps on happening. Okay, this is characteristic of everything in the world from earthquakes to the stock market uh, to your personal relationships, okay? Things happen to you, small things, right? You meet people, someone smiles at you, big deal, someone else smiles at you, big deal, someone else smiles at you, the next thing you know, yeah, your wife, okay? <laughs> so, it's just kind of constant input from the outside in this case, which triggers a big change, right? But there is another example that is pervasive in the world, and that is illustrated by evolution. So, this is theory of punctuated equilibrium uh, from Stephen Jay Gould, right? A evolutionary biologist. And he says that, that um, species don't develop gradually, right? From one species, you don't gradually morph to another. Suddenly, you get big changes, big changes, right? If you look in the fossil record, there's no gradual change. Everything is a sudden jump. How does this happen? Well, what happens is, in each species, you have mutations that slowly, slowly, slowly happen, and there is no effect of the mutation. But then, one mutation happens, and bang! there is a huge morphological change, or in this case, a color change, or pattern change, or whatever. But there is constant change in the genome, okay? And the interesting thing about this mutation is that it's based on this principle of self-organized criticality, okay? So you have to understand self-organized means it is generated from within. Criticality means the system is at a point where it can change. It's like changing state, going from uh, solid to liquid, or liquid to gas. You are changing state, and in order to change, you have to be at this critical state, like the temperature, you know, of 100 degrees, you can change to gas. Um, in the lab, you supply the temperature. It's an ex externally supplied uh, force that brings it to the critical thing, but in biological systems, something happens inside to bring it to a point where you can change. Okay, so that's how it is in evolution. That's how it is with earthquakes. That's how it is, I propose, in your brain. So you have spontaneous activity there all the time, going on and on and on and on and on, 
so that you can change quickly when something happens. Okay? If you are living in the real world, where there is constant threat of danger, you know, you want to be able to react quickly to the smallest hint of danger. So, your brain is like that, to make sure that you can deal with a threat. But also, the problem is that your brain might be so nimble that the smallest insult will make you go, you know, into a wild tangent unnecessary emotion, okay? So just imagine you're somebody who happens to be the president of the United States with all this military at your disposal, and somebody says something, and your brain is at this kind of hyperactive state where the small thing is like, go like this, like that, okay? It's not a good thing, right? The consequences of too much activity can also be bad in that sense. So, what, uh, uh, what can you do, okay? What can you do? Um, well, the first thing you have to know that it is totally normal that your brain is, has this kind of characteristic. If it doesn't have this kind of characteristic, you would not be able to function. And uh, secondly, you should aware that, be aware that other people are like that. So if they act in funny ways from the smallest perturbation, you have to understand it doesn't take a lot sometimes to make people go on a tangent, right? But for yourself, what you can do is be aware then this is the property of your brain, and so you don't react immediately to everything, right? And also, this principle of criticality, or self-organized criticality, expands well beyond the brain. And I think it, it actually applies to something uh, outside the brain as well, and you can see it organically within the school, right? You want the school to be able to achieve great things, but you all do not have to do great things all the time for the school to achieve great things. Each needs to do just a small bit to bring the school to a critical point where it takes a small activity, boom, suddenly you achieve something great, okay? So don't think that every change has to be big because constant small change will inevitably lead to huge consequences.